Well, the next uh, talk is going to be about why DNA and citizen science, and it's being delivered by Professor Mark Jobling, who is a professor of genetics at the University of Leicester. And since 1992, uh, Mark has been supported by fellowship, uh, fellowships from the, the Wellcome Trust to uh, continue his work, which is largely focused on the Y chromosome um, and looking at how that informs us about migrations. And um, uh, one, of the, one of the aspects of that, of course, is, is surname research, which is a very, very big part of uh, citizen science. And uh, Mark is going to talk to us today about why DNA citizen science and a bit about forensic genealogy. So please give a warm welcome to Mark Joplin. Thank you, Morris. Thanks very much. So it's nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me to the first of these events. I enjoyed going to Who Do You Think You Are Live? So this is a new chapter and it's a very nice venue to be in. So as the introduction said, I've worked on Y chromosome DNA for a very long time. And I'm going to tell you a bit about the history of the field, how it started out and how rubbish it was when we started. And how we have got to where we are quite a lot through the efforts of people like perhaps yourselves who've undergone DNA testing and then thought about how to share those data and how to use them in the most useful way. So we're in a situation now where most of the Y variation we know about actually comes from the activities of members of the public who put their hands in their pockets and get their Y chromosomes analysed rather than from academic laboratories. And also there are methods of analysing and understanding the data which are coming out of citizen science. So people are inventing those themselves and those are becoming used by the academic sector so we've got an interesting interaction now between an academic sector which is not very well funded in this area and the public who are funding themselves through paying essentially for their own testing and those two things are interacting in some quite interesting ways and then as Morris said I'll move at the end of the talk to look at another outcome of citizen science which is the fact that we have these now very large databases of SNP genotype data and how those are being used in law enforcement to try and uh, close cold cases. And this is an area we're moving into research-wise ourselves. So the Y chromosome is the only chromosome in the genome that really can be said to do one thing in particular. So the other chromosomes, you've got 22 pairs of other chromosomes, but they do all kinds of stuff. And the genes on them are, uh, make no particular sense as groups of genes. The Y chromosome is odd because it really does one thing. It has a raison d'etre, and that is to determine male sex. So it's sex determining. If, you, if a child is, if we're an, uh, uh, a zygote fertilized egg contains a Y chromosome, then all if things go to, go to plan, that individual will turn into a male. And it's interesting just to wonder why it's called a Y chromosome, so why they're called Y and X, and this is not the reason why. So this is from The Guardian some years ago, which says the X and Y chromosomes magnified and colorized, which determine gender, wrong word, never mind. Uh, so it's not magnified and colorized. These have been drawn by some amateur artist with a box of Crayola because they don't look like the X and the Y. And that's not the reason they're called the X and the Y. It's because when biologists started to, to realize chromosomes existed, they realized that most chromosomes made sense, they were in pairs. And then there was this other pair that didn't make sense. And so it was a mystery object, and it was found in things like this fire bug at the top here. So these, the, the people who did this work had done algebra at school, and what are the unknown quantities in algebra X and Y? So that's why they got called X and Y, nothing to do with shapes. So what happens if you have a Y chromosome is early on you have this structure, which sounds rather that it doesn't care about its future, called the indifferent gonad. And this thing is early in embryogenesis. Then if there's nothing else going on, it says, okay, I'll become an ovary. And then having become an ovary, it will produce the hormones that give rise to the female phenotype. So that's the default pathway of sex determination in mammals, including us. But if there's a Y chromosome there, then it says, I'll do something else. I'm going to become a testis. And then that secretes hormones which give rise to the male phenotype. So that's not the default pathway. You need a Y chromosome to do that. And it runs actually through this little gene here called SRY, which is a pathetic little gene. It's uh, very small and unlike other genes, it's not interrupted by other bits of DNA. So it's uh, an extremely small gene, uh, but it does all the, the, the um, nonsense that uh, gives rise to people like that. 
So, beautiful experiment from 1991. This is a mouse, as you might be able to tell, but I don't know if you're familiar with the sex, how to sex a mouse, but if you look at that part of the mouse, this is a boy. So, um, it's got all the boy bits a mouse needs, and it's actually, if you look at its chromosomes, it's got two X chromosomes. So, this should be a female mouse by rights, but what the scientists did in this experiment was give it a little piece of DNA containing just this one gene that's needed for maleness, and it turned it into a male. And it behaves like a regular male, so they called it Randy, being uh, having a sense of humour. But it's not fertile, so that mouse cannot go on and have other mice because it's only got the little bit of Y chromosome that makes it a, ma a male in the first place. You need the rest of the Y chromosome to do something, and that's to make sperm. So if you want to be a fertile male, you don't need just uh, the SRY gene, the triggering gene, you need other genes as well. That's actually an interesting um, issue with regard to males having their Y chromosomes tested because they could inadvertently find out that they have pieces of Y chromosome missing, which would mean that they were infertile. And actually, they may know that already, but if they didn't know that, that would be an interesting way to find out. So there's an ethical issue there that's not very much discussed. So Y chromosomes are actually not very much studied compared to other chromosomes. They're kind of neglected. And that's for a number of reasons. So one is that they're difficult to analyze. And that's because they're full of so-called repetitive DNA. So big pieces of DNA that are present more than one time. And that means understanding the structure with all that, those, that repetitive stuff around, sometimes called junk DNA, becomes very difficult. They're generally omitted from animal genome sequences. So here, for example, is the announcement of the sequence of the genome of an orangutan, which is very interesting to us, but they sequenced a female. They're more interested in X chromosomes than Y chromosomes, so we don't have an orangutan Y chromosome. There aren't many diseases associated with the Y chromosome, so parts of the human genome are studied because of disease, but the Y doesn't really have very much going on, apart from this infertility that I mentioned. So, Nonetheless, it's 2% of our genomes, and it, ha and it has uh, some genes on it, 80 or so protein coding genes, and it could be a source of male bias traits. So most diseases or disorders have a sex bias. Men and female don't show the same rates. And it could well be that the Y chromosome is contributing to some of those. One we know about is coronary artery disease risk. So there's a, a haplogroup, haplogroup I1, which I happen to be a bearer of myself, that increases your age-adjusted risk of coronary artery disease by 50%. We don't understand how that works at the molecular level. We know that it, it does not. And as I mentioned already, about 1% of men are infertile due to Y chromosome deletions. So pieces of DNA that should be there that aren't there. So if you think about human chromosomes, then most of them come in these nice regular pairs, as I said. But we've got this pair, which is called a heteromorphic pair, where you've got a big X chromosome and a little Y chromosome. How did it happen? So it happened like this cartoon is shown. You're starting about 300 million years ago. This was a pair of regular chromosomes. And then one of them became sex determining. And then through time, they lost and rearranged the material until we end up here on the right with the current situation. So that's a process of Y chromosome degeneration. The Y chromosome starts out here, a nice big chromosome just like the X. It, it becomes sex determining. And then by the time we get to now, we've got this small chromosome full of junk. So it's been degenerating, and this led to the idea that it might keep on degenerating. So it's lost about um, 920 genes over 300 million years. And this lady, Jennifer Marshall Graves, who's a biologist from Australia, you can tell she's from Australia because she's holding a koala bear there. And she studies marsupials and monitoring, so the weird creatures that live in uh, the antipodes. And she figured out that the rate of gene loss was such that we were going to lose the Y chromosome altogether. And this caused some panic in the newspapers. There were headlines in the Daily Mail at the time, men will disappear. However, if you look at the rate, it's going to take five million years. So I don't think we need to worry too much about it, since our species has only been around for 300,000 years so far, so never mind. So I don't think there's a risk of it, of it disappearing any time soon. So the other thing, and this is what makes Y chromosomes good for genealogical studies, is that it's a loner, it's on its own, and it doesn't interact with other chromosomes very much at all. So on the left here, you've got um, X chromosomes in a female, and these little crosses that are appearing between them are recombination points. 
So the X chromosomes cross over and reshuffle information with each other in females when they're making eggs, just like autosomes do in, in everybody. But on the right, you've got the X and the Y, and you've got crossing over just on the tip of the short arm of the Y, and sometimes the tip of the long arm. And that's important because it means that eggs and sperm always get one X or one Y and not an X and a Y or nothing at all. But in between, you've got this region where there's no crossover. So there's no reshuffling of the information in this most of the length of the Y chromosome. And that means it passes down from ancestors to descendants, like surnames do, without being reshuffled. And that's why it's such a powerful tool. So that's illustrated in this cartoon where you've got males uh, passing on their Y chromosome unbroken on, as this black symbol here. And of course females not having Y chromosomes. And this is analogous to the maternal inheritance of mitochondrial DNA, where you've got everyone having mitochondrial DNA and getting it through their maternal line. So we've got these two lines going back through time from uh, current day, a paternal line Y chromosomes, fathers to sons, and a maternal line of mitochondrial DNA, mothers to, to children, which, when you compare them in populations, tell you about the history of male and female behaviour. And that's one of the things that we do. We try and understand the past in terms of how did women and male men behave uh, through studying these kinds of things. So, what has been going on in genetic genealogy and through the work of companies like Family Tree DNA for for many years is trying to look at Y chromosome diversity. So it's fine, we know men have Y chromosomes, we want to be able to tell them apart and say that this man has one Y chromosome which is similar enough to this man's Y chromosome for them to have had a recent paternal ancestor in common. And when this business started out in the 19, early 1990s, when I got started on this, uh, people tried to find uh, six SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, so differences between sequences. And the early studies were pretty disappointing. So this is a study, this is supposed to be a tree, it's more like a stick, because in this study they didn't find any variation at all. So they looked, and they weren't sequencing very much DNA, because they, it was hard to do back then. They were sequencing a piece of DNA in quite a lot of men from all around the world, from every continent on Earth, and they found no variation at all. Every man was exactly the same. So it was pretty disappointing, and it indicated that the Y chromosome is not very diverse, and that's true. So by 95, there were a couple of papers. This is from Mike Hammer, who was intimately associated with family tree DNA, of course. I don't know who he still is. Which came up with a bunch of markers, now about now uh, three or four different markers. And then in the same year, there was a paper from Peter Goodfellow's lab, which came up with a few more. And as time went on, so now this is Peter Underhill's work from 2000, with 160 markers. And um, the YCC paper with 250 markers from 2002, and by 2008, I think that is, we've got about 600 markers. So there was an incremental increase in the number of markers that allowed you to divide Y chromosomes up into different classes. So this is a review that I wrote with my colleague Chris Tyler Smith, who's down in the picture on the bottom, looking typically Zen-like. And we had a tree in our paper, which is this strange structure here. So there wasn't much variation. So this was the dawn of really, 1995 was the dawn of thinking about using the Y to look at populations, to look at surnames, to look at male lineages. And we published another follow-up really in 2017, where things had come on markedly. So now we've got 60,000 SNPs. This is the Thousand Genomes Project Y chromosome tree. And all of this has been driven really by an academic enterprise with limited funding. So now, um, 2019, and I know that isog has been going for a while, um, but now we have a tree, um, which is the tree that most people use in academic areas as well as in um, gene genetic genealogy areas to refer to, the isog tree, which has, I think in its current manifestation, more than 82,000 SNPs, and a, and a note to say there are a lot more than this that are not in the tree. So it's, got, it's absolutely grown exponentially, and it's grown because people have had DNA tests. And the tree itself that you see on the ISOC website is not is driven and written, written and under um, and supported by people who are citizen scientists. So this tree is now the tree to refer to for everybody. Uh, and it's not produced by a standard academic process. It's not produced by a process of peer review. It's produced by essentially what you might call amateur scientists or citizen scientists working 
and putting those things together in a, in a really useful way. But it's having to run, run to stand still, like the Red Queen up here, because more and more and more are coming out, and they will continue to do so. So there's no end to this. So there are going to be individually specific SNPs, so there will be SNPs that, that one man uh, on the planet has and none other, no other has. And there will, of course, be SNPs that are highly associated with particular surnames, which is interesting. And another property of these kinds of trees, when you're just sequencing a big piece of chromosome, is now that the branches of these trees become proportional to time. So in, in the bad old days, when we had two or three markers, we had a tree, but we had no, no idea how much time was in every branch of that tree. Were some branches very young, some branches very old, we hadn't got a clue. We didn't really know that until about till the, the advent of next generation sequencing, which is the technology that underlies the big Y test. But now we have these trees where time is the, is, is the length of the branch. And that's really good because it allows us to work out how old lineages really are. And to look at things like expansions of lineages that occurred in the Bronze Age in Europe, which we now have a really good handle. Whereas before, we hadn't got a clue how old those things were. And we hypothesized all kinds of wrong ideas about their ages. And now we know they're young, the last few thousand years. The Bronze Age had a massive impact on European prehistory. So when you get a big Y test, you're not getting your whole Y chromosome sequenced. And that's because of what I said earlier, that a lot of the chromosome is full of repeated sequences. So this at the top is a uh, so-called ideogram. That's the, what the Y chromosome looks like to a cytogenetics person when they stain it and look at it down a microscope. And then here it's broken up into so-called sequence classes. So this stuff here in brown is hyper-repetitive DNA called heterochromatin. No one ever looks at that. In fact, you can't. It's so repetitive and goes on for miles that it's not telling you anything and it, it, it is essentially impossible to analyze. So it's this bit here, up here, it's the blue section that people focus on. And that's expanded here on this line. And so even here, you can see that there are these purple bits and some brown bits. And the purple and brown bits are pretty tough to analyze. So this green track is the key one here because it's the so-called callable sequence. So when you try and sequence a Y chromosome, a lot of the material that's not in this green bit is essentially uninterpretable because it's repeated and you can't understand its, its structure and you can't understand the variants that arise in it. But the green stuff, which is about 10 million base pairs of DNA, 10 megabases, is the callable sequence and that's what big Y tests. And it's also what's tested in many academic studies using similar or some other kinds of technologies. So you might wonder, well, would I get more value for money if I could test this other stuff? And my answer is no. You will get a lot of confusing information that's so hard to interpret that it's not really worth having. Um, you might be able to squeeze a few more variants out of it or snips, but is it worth it? I don't think so. So the big Y test, I don't know whether it still costs this, but um, at the time I took this, made this slide, it was 495 bucks. And then of course, as you know, you can have, as the previous speaker I think was talking about, you can have YSTR tests when you get 37 or 67 or even 111 STRs typed. And these are different markers. So these are mutating at a much faster rate than SNPs. So you've got almost like two clocks ticking at different rates tied together on this piece of DNA coming down lines from fathers to sons through time. So taking all this together, you've got a fabulously informative set of markers for Y chromosomes that are being uh, presented by companies like Family Tree, all for the price of a bottle of Cristal Champagne, which I'm sure you're happy to give up just once in a while in order to have all this fabulous information about your Y chromosomes. And you know, if you'd asked me, um, say, 10 years ago, well, would people be able to do all this stuff? I would have said, no way. And a lot of scientists would have had exactly the same view, that it was impossible, but it's not. It's here and it's now, and it's very much possible. So STR testing is another area in which the, the, um, the commercial industry, people like Family Tree, um, are going much farther than academic uh, scientists ever bother to do, because we can't afford it. Uh, we have to fund it from grant funding or from other funding, and, and no one will give you the money to do it. So again, this is an area where citizen science is really driving the game. Um, and it's another interesting area is the business of haplogroup prediction. So that if you have a set of STRs, you can actually say which branch of the tree 
that that haplotype probably comes from uh, because of the pattern of numbers within those STRs. And that's called haplogroup prediction. And for a long time, the best predictor has been the Athi predictor, another citizen science product, not in not peer reviewed, but out there widely used. And now in my mind, the best one is the NevGen predictor, another uh, citizen science product, which we use and we communicate with the people who wrote it. They're just amateur scientists in Serbia, very nice guys, very modest. And we say your uh, predictor is brilliant and we validated it using our own data sets. And now we use it in publications. So it's an interesting thing. These guys are not trained molecular biologists or geneticists at all. Another area where citizen science is doing something useful is going outside the areas of the world in which people have really looked before. One example here is the Arabian Peninsula. So this guy up here is one of my PhD students, Yahya Kubrani, so he's from Saudi Arabia. And Yahya's running, he's doing a lot of things, but one of the things he's doing is a citizen science product project reaching out to people in um, Arabs, or Arabic speaking countries. And this is our website, and this is our Arabic part of our website where we're appealing for people who've had big Y tests and full genomes court tests to send us their data. And we have an online portal where they do that. And we've gathered about 1,000 big Y sequences from people from countries of the Arabian Peninsula and around the Gulf, which we didn't really, nobody really studied those before. Um, there were no projects there. There was no population geneticists working there. But now we've got a great data set because of citizen scientists there who are interested in sharing their data and, and understanding it. So that's another really good aspect. So that's really, uh, that's where I'm going with the why. And I wanted to just change gear now and look at the rest of the genome because of the issue of forensic genealogy, which is another area that's been kind of unexpected area really over the last 12 months. It was in April 2018, the Golden State Killer was um, identified and arrested, alleged Golden State Killer, we should say. So that's come out of databases that have come out of citizen science activity. And we couldn't have predicted that either. So this is the foyer of the building where I work. And it's got a DNA double helix in it. And on the back it says, on the 10th of September 1984, Alec Jeffries accidentally discovered the world's first DNA fingerprint. So I work in the building where DNA fingerprinting was invented. And when I went to Leicester, Alec Jeffries was very much active in working there. So what he did was give rise to the standard, uh, very effective forensic genetics system that we have today. And what that does these days is work on the basis of, the, of investigative databases, like the National DNA Database. So at the top here, this is what an, S, an autosomal STR profile looks like. So it's just a string of numbers. And a string of numbers is exactly what databases like. So you can build a database. And in the UK, we have the first in the world. It started in 95. And what happens these days, for example, you have a crime scene, a perpetrator's profile, you, you profile it, stick it in the database. Another crime scene, a profile, you profile it, stick it in the database. And every now and again, this happens, a scene-to-scene -scene hit. So now you know the same person was in both of these scenes. Useful information. Then you might arrest this guy for a, a, fen a recordable offence in the UK, and that includes, for example, urinating in the street. So there was a famous case where a guy was arrested for urinating in the street and his profile went in the database and lo and behold it matched some crime scenes and it turned out he was a he he was he murdered some people <laughs> so his crime of weeing in the street was actually the one that got him in the end so this happens all the time and we have a terrific database which is very effective how effective about 66% of the time if you have an unknown profile from a crime scene you get a match and you have a suspect and you can go around and investigate that person. You have an address 66% of the time. However, the other side of that is 34% of the time you don't. Now, this 66% is better, it's a better hit rate than any other database anywhere in the world. But 34% of the time you don't have a hit. So what do you do? So there are lots of things you can do, but one of them is this, which is to look for da databases which might give you a clue as to who that person might be. And two of those sources are biobanks and genome projects, and of course, citizen science uh, genomic data sets, which are publicly available. So these are interesting because they're population biased. Not all populations of the world have these things, because not everyone around the world participates in genetic genealogy. You need money, you need access to resources, perhaps, that you don't have everywhere. 
They're socioculturally biased, so within a society, not all parts of society will participate in, ge in genetic genealogy. So and there are, of course, interesting ethical issues, which are, I see somebody's discussing those later today, so I'll briefly I'll pass over and let them do that. But there are resources there. And those resources have been attempted, people have attempted to use them for a while. So this is a Y chromosome case, this is the Michael Usry case, and it's around the killing of a woman in 1996 in the United States. And there was a YSTR profile from that crime scene. And it found a near match in the Ancestry.com website, where a database which was publicly available at the time. So that came uh, from a guy called Michael Usry Sr. And he had donated his DNA to a non-profit, which was called Sorensen Foundation, which you may be aware of. And then that database was sold on to the profit-making company Ancestry.com without uh, any, permit, any knowledge of any of its, the people in the database, as it goes. So the police subpoenaed them to say what the name of that individual was. So they found it was Usri, and that led them to suspect his son, because Michael Usri Sr. was too old to be the, the offender in this case. But his son was of the right age, and as you can see from this picture, unfortunately for him, he had interest in horror movies, and so that probably made them even more to think this must be our guy, somewhat naively. And so they nicked him simply on the basis of a YSTR match. And they sampled his DNA, they interrogated him, they held him for 24 hours, um, and he was exonerated. He had nothing to do with the offence. So this caused something of a scandal, and it caused the closure of the database. Now, as you know, you probably heard already, Y data, Y DNA data uh, will give false positives because your brother, your uncle, your cousin, your dad, is going to have the same Y as you. Other men in your same surname lineage you never even knew were related to you might have the same Y chromosome as you. So Y chromosomes are actually a bit dodgy for this. So let's go to the autosomes. This is the DNA you get from mum and dad. And this is a bit more interesting because it has a lot more power to detect kinship relationships among people. But the signal fades through time. So if you look here, then you've got these second cousins and you can trace the paths back to their common ancestors and come up with what's called a coefficient of relationship, the proportion of genome shared. So for second cousins, they share one thirty-second of their genome. And you can estimate this for any set of human relationships within pedigrees. So a single step is reducing the genetic component from the ancestor by one half. So there's a certain point at which the signal fades out altogether and you don't get any meaningful information over what the general sharing is in the population anyway. And if you look at everyone in this room, it all share DNA, segments of DNA. So that's kind of background sharing because we might be from, we're human, A, and B, some of us are from roughly the same population. But what we want to get to is information specifically about families. To do that, you need SNP chip data because you're sampling hundreds of thousands of bits of the genome. So we're away from the Y chromosome now into the DNA that comes from mum and dad, halves every generation. Can we make links between individuals on the basis of that? And the way this has been approached is to use this particular database, which you might have heard of, called GEDmatch, which is an open SNP genotype database, again built by citizen scientists. So nothing to do with any academic enterprise, all of this. And it houses the um, genotype SNP or the SNP genotype data from chips from direct-to-consumer uh, companies, many of them, like 23andMe, for example, um, for about 950,000 people. So this is a serious database. And it also contains genealogical data. So people will upload information about their family trees, their relatives. So, uh, if you look in it, you can see email addresses. Sometimes they have their names. So ain't any privacy in there. And there are tools for processing SNP data uh, for compatibility, and there are also tools for kinship detection. So if you put your genome, you put your uh, 23andMe or family tree DNA uh, genotype data in and wait a day, it will give you a list of your matches. So it'll give you your close matches and your distant matches, and you can get a graph that shows them going back to the most distantly related individuals. And it will also do some ancestry et estimation as well, so it will tell you about your ancestry breakdown. And that came in useful in this case. So this is uh, uh, Joseph uh, James D'Angelo here, this guy. And this is a photo fit of, it, of from the time he was offending, assuming he is the guilty party, which seems very likely now. So this is a man who committed 12 murders and more than 50 rapes in California in uh, 1970s and 80s, and was undetected. 
But this guy was arrested in 2018, almost exactly one year ago. So it appears to have been done by Tate doing a snip chip on an old crime scene sample. So DNA that this guy left behind at a scene that was enough and in sufficient quality to give a snip chip result. And then that was uploaded to GEDmatch and he found between 10 and 20 relatives and Barbara Ray Ventos, the ex-wife of Craig Venter, the guy behind the private genome project, um, put it together in quite a lot of work, I believe, to give rise to suspicion that it was this fellow here. He was trailed by the police. He dropped a tissue next to his car, having blown his nose. Police bagged it up. They did a DNA profile, a standard autosomal STR profile. It matched their other crime scenes, and they nicked him. When nicked, he refused to give a DNA sample himself, but the judge ruled that he had to. Yeah, he had to. He could not not consent to that. So you'll see this is the permission at the time the work was done by the police, and you had to agree that the DNA data you were entering was your own, or DNA data from someone who consented to you entering that. And the police ticked yes, and that was not telling the truth, because it was the DNA of a, the perpetrator of a, of a sexual assault. So the police told a fib there, but they got their man, so you might think that justifies the means. Now the GEDmatch front page has changed to tell you that um, your data might be used to locate someone else in a law enforcement exercise. However, everybody who's in there already, uh, do they know that the consent has changed or that the con conditions have changed? Probably not. Would they care? Possibly not. I've given a talk to undergraduate students and asked them what they would do, and nearly all of them are in favor of this and said, sure, I'd put my DNA, and if it shocks someone bad, even if they're related to me, that's in the public good. So that's a debate that needs to be had. So as well as snip chip typing, um, I've alluded to so-called next generation sequencing, where the cost of sequencing is falling very fast. So it's now cheap enough to sequence your own genome. Some of you might have done it. And you can use that in crime scene samples too, because you can use this technology to sequence a 50,000-year-old Neanderthal toe bone and get a, the sequence of a Neanderthal woman who lived in the Altai Mountains 50,000 years ago. You can sure as hell get a genome from this girl who died in 1981, and sure enough, you can. So this is the so-called buckskin girl case. A blood sample was taken from her after she was found, and it was stored in a lab at room temperature since 1981, sat on the shelf. But it was good enough quality with this technology to give a genome sequence. And when that was done and the SNP profile was extracted and it went into GEDmatch, it found a second cousin straight away. She was interviewed and it turned out that this led to an identification of this girl uh, as being Marcia King. So we still don't know who killed her, but we know who she is now, which was not the case. So this has led to a lot of activity and a lot of companies coming out of the woodwork or new companies being formed offering promises. One thing I want to say is that in the United States, their standard forensic genetic system is pretty ropey compared to here. So what happens in the States is they're not even, they don't even DNA profile all their convicted individuals, let alone suspects. Whereas here, all our convicted individuals are profiled and all of our suspects are profiled, even if all you've done is pee in the street. So the States, there's an, a lot of these cases, I think, would have been solved by conventional policing if it had happened in the US. They're going down this route because they've got essentially a chaotic forensic genetic system. So since this case, there have been a lot more uh, cases. So that there's a, an article in Forensic Science International that came out a couple of weeks ago listing these in rather a rambling paper. They, they talk about all the cases that this company called Parabon uh, has solved. Um, all quite nasty cases, so you might think it's, it's good that they've solved them. Um, they give a rather tantalizing detail about how they actually do this. And GEDmatch is only one of the companies out there, so there are, or one of the databases, I'm sorry, out there. There are others, and there's something called the Personal Genome Project you might be aware of, where you can get your genome sequenced by that project, and to agree, what you have to do is make all of your genome publicly available for anyone else in the world to use. And if you're interested in that, have a look. If you want to do it, you have to do an exam. So they want to make sure that people are really understand what they're signing up for. So you have to do tutorials online, they're really nice, and then you have to do an exam, and you've got to pass before they'll let you become part of the project. And then they'll sequence your genome for nothing, and you will be one of the, there are only 107 in there currently, you will be one of those. And they're very useful resources, we use them in our work quite a lot. 
So a lot of these databases are running under the same ethos of genome sharing. Some of them are trying to give you the power to actually sell your genome. So you get it sequenced and then you make it available to people. You kind of license it to them. So it's, it's a valuable information to all kinds of people. Why not get them to pay per, pay per view, if you like, on your genome? So it's an interesting world we're moving into. And it's not just genealogy databases. I mentioned earlier healthcare, and healthcare databases and biobanks. And there are a lot of those out there. Some of you might be in UK Biobank, for example. It's 500,000 people who've signed up to hand over their health records and biological samples uh, for the public good, for a big health-driven project, which is absolutely fantastic. But that reveals interesting things about families as well that perhaps people didn't know. So this is from the recent Biobank paper. And this is an interesting little paragraph, which they don't explain. So it says there are 172 family groups with five or more individuals that are second degree relatives or closer. And they tried not to sample relatives, okay? So it said one such group has 11 individuals who are all second degree relatives of each other. Half siblings, grandparent, grandchild, or avuncular, they can't tell. Because all of the 55 pairs are second degree relatives, at least 10 of them must be half siblings with the same shared parent. We confirmed that the shared parent must be their father because they do not all carry the same mitochondrial DNA and the males all have the same Y chromosome alleles. Interesting. What does it mean? And it probably means artificial insemination by donor. These are the children of the same man who gave a sperm sample in a clinic. And this project, without ever intending to do so, has revealed those connections, that these individuals are actually half-siblings and they never knew them to be so. So even in projects like this, all big genomics projects, whether they're GEDmatch or Citizen Science or Biobank like this, are going to reveal things that you didn't know they were going to reveal. And everybody who does genealogy knows about what was called in the last talk non-paternity events as well. So we're in an interesting world where you've got people analysing genomes for different reasons with different kinds of ethoses, if that's the right plural for the word. So you've got, and then you've got things like Facebook out there, which contains a lot of personal information that people gaily put out about themselves, which tell you, tell others when their birthday is, who they associate with, what their hobbies are, what their children look like, what they look like. And we'll know, we know from Cambridge Analytica scandal that those kinds of things are quite widely harvested. So in that kind of world, it's interesting. You've got parts of the industry which have got bioethical principles, which are very stern. You've got stern anonymity principles under clinical testing. And those are being undermined because anonymity gets under, undermined when you can predict a surname from a Y chromosome data set that's public. You have strict privacy around some. In the ancestry sector, there's generally free sharing via citizen scientists, not always, but a lot of sharing. People send us their own genomes, whole genomes unsolicited sometimes. Would you like a, my genome? Here it comes in a little envelope and on, a, on a USB stick. And then you've got forensics at the top and basically that's their ethos. Let's just get the bad person no matter what it takes. So I think there is some work to be done in trying to figure out how all these things go together. And that work might not be over-regulation, which tends to stifle things generally, but there has been a lot of developments without any discussion. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, I want to just acknowledge funders that fund some of our work, or people who support our work by collaboration. Say so we've got a bunch of great PhD students all from all around the world working on quite a lot of diverse projects, including some of the ones I talked to you about, and that we work in a very international department. And one of the great things about uh, working in the university sector in the UK, and I hope it continues in the post-Brexit world, is that we live in a very international world where we can see how other countries go about facing some of these kinds of challenges and um, also doing their own genetic genealogy, which is going on outside the UK as well as within. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. <clears throat> Oh, you, you've raised some very interesting uh, questions in the presentation, especially in the last few slides. Um, but of course, before the law enforcement came along and started using genetic genealogy techniques to catch criminals and identify unidentified human remains, the various other um, aspects of genetics, 
and the various ethical principles that they have produced. Was there a lot of um, communication and collaboration between the different departments, if you like? Um, or has that only really now come to the fore that there is a need for this kind of uh, networking and collaboration between different people to try and uh, sort through a lot of the ethical problems that have come up recently in the field? Well, I think that most of those other areas ran under the general principle of an anonymity. So like when we write consent forms, we say you will not be identifiable by a third party from the da any data we shall publish about you. And that's the thing that's changed because if you publish a genome sequence now, it's no longer as easy to say that a third party wouldn't be able to identify you because if they know what they're doing and they triangulate databases properly, as Jan Ehrlich has showed in the United States, then you actually can be an, an, uh, identified. So when people sign up to, the whole principle has been fine for a long time between all these diverse biomedical areas, sign up to, that, uh, to um, for example, 100,000 Genomes Project, which is the NHS project in the UK, sign up to the Veterans Project in the US, sign up to the UK Biobank, sign up to the people of the British Isles Project, Walter Bodmer's project, and you will not be identifiable. And what's changed is the technology has come along in surprising ways to make that, to undermine that. So I think those industries were, or those sectors were fine until this undermining, but now we've got an additional alarming undermining because you've got the law enforcement coming in and using resources for purposes that they were never intended to be used for. So I think everybody's now got, been shaken up by this. So those principles, whatever they were, have to be revisited because of this unexpected change driven by technology and driven by databases and public data. So we're in an interesting world, I think. I don't know how it's going to pan out. Do you think there will be a unified ethical committee or ethics body that helps guide the various biomedical and um, genealogical uh, divisions within this group? Um, I'm pessimistic about that because it ha they haven't been that good about talking to each other so far. And furthermore, even between nations, there are a lot of different perspectives about how you do things. Um, so I think it's quite difficult to see how that's going to happen. I mean, within the forensic genealogy, there is a group being proposed to the International Society of Forensic Genetics uh, to look at this very issue and come up with some recommendations. So people within the industry of that in particular industry will then have recommendations that they ought to think about. Whether they'll stick to them or not is quite another matter. And uh, in China, they've tested 50 million people uh, without their consent. They didn't actually know they were having a DNA test when it was done. Yes. <laughs> that yeah, raises well, some ethical questions on this side of the Atlantic. <laughs> yes. Different kettle of fish. <laughs> it is a def difficult ke different kettle of fish completely. Um, questions for Mark. Yeah, we have a question down here. I'll come down with the microphone. Do you think um, single sequencing, single molecule sequencing will ever do a human chromosome? Uh, yes, probably. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can almost do it uh, with PAC bio sequencing, Pacific Biosciences sequencing, and Illumina, which is the kind of monopolizer of world sequencing technologies, has now bought Pacific Biosciences. So it means Illumina think that's the way to go and it's going to be expensive. So it costs 16,000 pounds to have a packed bio a human genome sequence. So it's beyond the pockets of most of you here, even if, even if you gave up all of your crystal champagne, you still wouldn't be able to afford it. So um, it will happen. I mean, I think the, the bit on the end of the Y chromosome, the heterochromatin, I mean, that's a real challenge. You know, even thinking that unbelievable things happen, that seems like a very difficult thing to do. The middle bits of, of chromosomes, called the centromeres, are more interesting because they're functional. They actually determine how chromosomes segregate as cells divide. So there's more of a biological reason for understanding those. And there was a publication of a whole group human centromere, I think through PacBio or even nanopore sequencing. So the nanopore sequencing technology where you can get a, which we have in our lab, um, you can get a sequencer which is about the size of that, plugs into a laptop, uh, and it just runs off the laptop. Uh, that technology is cool. It gives very long sequencing reads, and in principle, it could be used in the field. So why we're interested in it is from animal conservation work, going into um, Uganda and finding uh, somebody's killed a gorilla, and uh, then you find someone with blood 
in their back of their car and you want to know if that's the gorilla blood, then it's best to do that on site rather than send the DNA off to South Africa, which is the only place in Africa you can do that work currently. So that kind of technology is not going to be applied in the genetic genealogy industry very much, I don't think, but it's cool technology and who knows where it'll go. It could be the company that makes those devices wants everyone to have a DNA sequencer in their house. Everyone. Not, you know, forget a dishwasher, have a DNA sequencer. That's what they say. Other questions for Mark? And we have a question here from Debbie at the front. With the big um, research databases like UK Biobank and 100,000 Genomes, do you think that law enforcement in the UK might want to try and access those databases if they can't um, get any success in the UK DNA database? Because that would seem more logical to go with one of those rather than GEDmat, which is probably 80% American. And would they be allowed to do that if they, if they wanted to? I'm sure they'd love to. Um, I don't think they'll be able to. Those uh, kinds of databases are fenced around very seriously with access restrictions. And the coding, I mean, the whole, there, is, there is in the healthcare sector a whole industry around how you can share data about patients across projects without de-anonymizing them. And there are some very serious people working on that. So that's part of the kind of cyber security uh, ring around those kind of data sets. So I don't think the police would ever be allowed to do that, no. So I think they might, they might very much want to do that, but I don't think they will be able to do that. And the question about Jed Match's composition is an interesting one, and that's something we're proposing to test, actually, what its composition really is by, by experimenting, by querying it with very large numbers of sequences and trying to work out what kind of composition it actually has. Another question here. It's really interesting, this the whole, the whole session. You mentioned law enforcement, but there's another element that you mentioned earlier I just wanted to ask you about. You mentioned you're an I1 and you have a higher possibility of heart problems. And, and I, I share that, so I'm, I didn't know that. I'm a bit worried about that now. Um, but also, I did, a, I did a 23andMe test, which shows I'm, I'm not long for this world, apparently. I've got lots of different things that I could have. Do you think that there's a, there's a chance here that, that we're moving into the realms where insurance companies are going to start to want to look at DNA testing? Because I, I could see that. If that's not happening already, I can see that happening quite quickly. Hmm. I mean, that, the insurance company argument has been in people's minds for a long time. Yeah. And essentially, it, you know, currently it's not allowed to use that information. So it's forbidden by law. Um, whether they'd want to use it, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult one. Most of the 20... 23andMe health predictions you get are rather small increases in relative risk. And in fact, the coronary artery disease one, it's a 50% higher age-adjusted risk um, on, on top of the, the general risk in the population. So it's nothing to get too frightened about. I mean, I think one of the... So I don't think insurance uh, industry is going to get that excited about most of the variants that are disease variants reported by companies. I mean, some disease variants have a high risk of uh, early death, for example. I mean, things like heart defects like long QT syndrome, which has a genetic basis where you can drop dead uh, quite young all of a sudden, and, and, and things like late onset disorders, which are genetically um, determined. But mostly those things are not being tested for by the company. So it's interesting, 23andMe, they do SNP testing, so they're not testing the variants that cause the diseases, they're inferring the disease variants by so-called linkage disequilibrium. Sometimes they don't do that very well. So and what's almost more alarming is their false negatives. Because they do a test for BRCA1, BRCA2, which are the high penetrance breast cancer mutations. And they're giving people the all clear based on looking at only a small subset of those, of those mutations. And so that could give a woman a sense of relief that she's free. And then she's actually got another mutation which they're not seeing in their test and she can develop breast cancer and then have a proper test and find actually she did carry a mutation. So I think that's the more alarming side of it, a sort of false reassurance that some of those tests for serious disorders are giving currently than the risk that you uh, mentioned. What's more interesting is that full genomes court, have your genome sequence, it's pretty cheap, a few hundred bucks. So they're giving you your whole sequence, that includes all your disease variants. So all of the bits, single nucleotide changes that really could cause disease, of course, you have no way of analysing that, and then there'll be a citizen science project that comes along 
and it gives you an output and tell, starts to give you your risk. And that's not mediated by any healthcare provider or any doctor or any clinician. So that could cause a lot of alarm and also a lot of false reassurance as well because of false negatives. So it's, a, it's an interesting area, I think. And we have a question here and then a question here. Sorry, mine's a um, follow on from that last one. I've had my DNA done, but my daughter refuses to have hers done because she believes medical records will be looked at and she's really worried. And she is a consultant doctor. So she must know something I don't. <laughs> you know something I don't. <laughs> well, you've had yours done, so then she's already had half of hers done. Without, did she consent? <laughs> did she consent to you doing the test? <laughs> Good. Uh, another question here. Thanks. I'm just back to the SNP testing. Um, I'm just kind of interested on a personal level because I've looked at different prefixes and I believe PH is done by Leicester. Is that right? Yes. That because was. my terminal SNP has just turned up. It's been changed to PH. Oh, has it? And it's only my dad and myself on okay. our own branch now. Am I right in thinking you're Irish? Yeah. <laughs> because we studied, I mean, we did a population study. So we had 20 um, Irish uh, in our study and 20 English, 20 Orcadians and things. So, and we, we went to some lengths to try and make sure people were, um, had ancestry going back several generations. So we got those from a guy called Gian Piero Caballeri, who's in, works at, it's not, not where, is, where does he work? It's not, Royal College of Surgeons in Dublin, yeah. Right. So the, our samples were from there. So they're kind of kosher Irish, if you like. So, yeah, I mean, many other studies, perhaps th those particular lineages have not yet been sampled. Yeah. Right. And it's just as nobody matching. And just one other thing following on as well. My sister is a clinical dietitian in St. James's Hospital in Dublin, and she absolutely refuses for the same reason to do her DNA as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Very good. Any other questions for Mark? Okay, well, um, thanks for a very interesting discussion. Um, we've raised some very uh, interesting points there. No doubt as time goes on, we will, the whole situation will become a little bit muddier and a little bit clearer at the same time. But thanks for giving us a wonderful introduction to the area. Mark Jobling. <laughs>